We hear this passage often. We hear it here every time we gather to celebrate this, this feast of St. Luke. How Jesus begins his ministry, his mission among us by opening up the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and reading this prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Then he rolls up the scroll. He sits down. And then he says those words. Those words which at the very beginning of his ministry prove to be the words that will be his ultimate undoing. In your hearing, these words are being fulfilled. In other words, he is saying to the people around him, you hear these words of the prophet? Right here. He's pointing to himself and saying, this is how they will be fulfilled. In the work that I am about to to initiate, to begin. That's what gets him in trouble. Because, you know, those words from the prophet Isaiah have been around a long time by the time Jesus came about. They had been around for some 600 years or so, and they had been read in synagogues on a frequent basis, very much like we read them on a frequent basis. So... They rang in the ears of the people of the synagogue community very much like they ring in our own ear. Very familiar. But you see, familiar words often lose their meaning, their potency, because they are so familiar. That's the problem. You see, because when they become familiar, we can easily say, well, yes, of course, they're getting done somewhere, someplace, somehow. They're someone, and we often say, they're someone else's responsibility. Because after all, if they're real, and they should be being done, and I'm not doing them, someone must be doing them. And you know, part of the problem is these are prophetic words, and we believe them to be the word of God. So it must be God who is responsible for them, and so it must be God who is doing them. <laughs> see, and there's the problem. Because you, you see, God no one to do them. God. That's what Jesus' work, his great work, was from the very beginning. Was to teach us that these prophecies do not come true until they take root in the hearts of those who seek to follow God. They do not come true. They do not become real in the world until they have a lasting impact on those who claim to be the disciples of the law. Until they have a real impact on those who claim to be followers of the gospel, of the good news that Jesus comes to proclaim. In other words, all of these things that Jesus says he is about to do don't happen until we get about the business of doing them. And that, my friends, is probably the biggest criticism that the world has of the church, that we talk a lot. We have a lot of words, but our actions 
are few. Oh, I'm not saying we don't do anything. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we just talk and do nothing. But too often, we talk more than we do. Would it be so that we did more than we talked? That's kind of what we are about to enter into, a time of reflection here in our own parish, a time of thinking and self-examination, a time of considering during this next year. Under this theme, you've been hearing a little bit about, under this word, hospitality. What does it really mean to be hospitable? Hospitable. Because, you know, most of us, we kind of think of hospitality as being nice, of being welcoming in that sense of being warm and kindly to people, of making sure that they have a place to sit, and making sure that they have everything that they need in the moment. Some of us think that it's being having good etiquette and good manners, and it is all of those things to be absolutely sure. But you see, Christian hospitality is much deeper. It is much more profound, because it is a core value of the kingdom of God. You know those signs that we have, the Episcopal Church welcomes you, isn't that really the message of hospitality? We welcome you. It means much more than our doors are open and we want you to come in and worship us. And while you're here, by the way, drop a dollar in the offering plate. What it really means is that you are welcome amongst us to be accepted, to be welcomed in as a member of our family, in all of your brokenness, in all of the problems that you bring with you, all of the baggage that you carry with you, you can bring all of that, and we will accept it all. You can be part of us. You are part of us because you are a child of God. Regardless of who your family is, regardless of what ethnicity you are, regardless of where you were born, regardless of what citizenship you are, regardless of what sexual orientation you are, regardless of what identity you claim, makes no difference to God, so why does it make any difference to any other human being? That's what welcoming means. That's what hospitality is. So when we say you are welcome, it doesn't simply mean, oh, come on in. We'll give you a cup of coffee and a cookie. Or we'll give you a meal. Or we'll let you stay for a while and get warm. But don't stay too long. No. It means once you walk in the door, we will acknowledge you for the dignity that you bear because you bear the image and the likeness of our God. You bear the icon of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your brokenness, you carry wounds that he suffered for our sake, for our life. 
when you come in, you bear the promise of the resurrection. You bear the promise of everlasting life. That's welcome. That's hospitality. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring good tidings, good news to the poor, to those who are at the margins of society, sight to the blind, to tell those who cannot walk that here they have a place of safety, to those who cannot defend themselves that we will defend them, to those who are not able that we will make them strong. We may not be able to take away that which causes the suffering, but we will make up for what they lack. That's the message of the kingdom. That's what Jesus came to proclaim. That's what we must do. Otherwise, they are but empty words. The words of the prophet have been around for 3,000 years. God is still waiting. Waiting for his children to make them real. Let's get 